once again, uh, I welcome you to this uh, afternoon program. The Lord is good and uh, we really appreciate uh, his mercy upon us. And uh, I would have liked to talk uh, about uh, some things that are happening around the world. The times that we are living in are interesting times. And uh, we are told that uh, the wise shall be able to understand, but the wicked shall not understand a thing. So I know the Lord is doing a lot of things and uh, we want to be on his side, not for the fear of being lost, not for the joy of being saved, but uh, for the whole purpose of vindicating his character. That is what is most important. All of you know what is happening around the world. And uh, as the book of Matthew chapter 24 says that uh, these things are birth pains or what we call the birth pangs of uh, the coming crisis and the second coming of Jesus Christ. If this earth has to continue, it has, it will continue for a very short time. But uh, this is not a message to scare us, but this is a message to call us unto repentance, uh, reconsecration, and the seeking of the Lord. And uh, as I have said, you people know what is happening around the world. And uh, actually, it, it is interesting when uh, we look at these things and see how everything is just coming to an end. And uh, this is tremendous fire running like uh, just uh, uh, water and all this stuff that is happening. I hope uh, it uh, draws us closer to Christ. It helps us understand that really the Bible is true and what has been prophesied that is going to happen really is happening before our eyes. So we don't have a shadow of doubt that uh, what is happening is uh, uh, apocalyptic in nature. What is happening before our eyes is uh, fulfillment of prophecies. And so when you see these things happen, Christ says that uh, as you see them happen, your redemption draweth nigh. And uh, I just pray that uh, we may be able to understand what the Lord is speaking. The Lord is speaking so loudly to his church, but who has ears to hear? Revelation says that uh, the spirit speaks. Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear. These are the fires in California and uh, we are seeing that the riots that are going on in America and the lockdowns in Australia, streets empty and uh, all this stuff that we can see on the screen. But it is not the wickedness of the world that uh, to really push us so much to worship the, the Lord in truth and spirit. As we see wickedness growing in this world, we are reminded of in uh, the book of uh, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. I'll just open it. The book of Isaiah, chapter 60. What is, what, what is God calling us to do at such a time as this? What is God calling us to do? Arise and shine for thy light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So as we see evil and calamities increasing fourfold and tenfold, what the Lord is calling us is to arise and shine. 
this brings me to the message of the hour. We have been going through the series of justification by faith and uh, the history therein. And uh, I just want to pray and then we go into the next segment. We still have some four to three sessions and and then uh, I'll be able to complete this history of Minneapolis and the aftermath. And so I invite you wherever you are, we bow down for our word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and so grateful that uh, we can live in such a time as this. Please, Lord, I pray that uh, you may impart thy spirit upon thy people that are languishing in death like slumber and uh, backsliding, that how be it this uh, lion may be awakened when it is not too late. Thank you for thy grace and thank you for thy love in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, the Lord is speaking to us and uh, he will want us to make our acts right. I want to take you back to 1888 and the things that I have been showing you on the screen, they are the very things that were happening back in 1888 and then the Lord sent his messenger, uh, Eti Jones and uh, Wagona so that uh, the church may be revived as the calamities increased upon the land and there was the push for Sunday laws. The Lord wanted to prepare his church. And I'm so glad that uh, while we are seeing these calamities happening, while we are seeing what is happening uh, uh, around the world and all uh, these uh, tragedies that are happening, the Lord is raising up people who can sound the fourth angel's message and this is justification by faith, the message that has to go to the whole world. That as evil increases and all these things increase, the Lord is bringing back the message of uh, justification uh, by faith so that the church may be prepared for the harvest. Two groups are being made up, the righteous and the unrighteous. And so, these messages are being brought back. This is the time that the Lord wants to do something for his church. And so it is not just a mere talking that we are talking, but we must even understand the times that you are living in, the only definition of sin. The Lord will want us not to be confused with the ideas of what is sin. The Lord will not want us to be confused by uh, the nature of Jesus Christ. The Lord will not want us to be confused by what is the seal of God. And uh, the mark of the beast is what actually has been said it is, but more has to be revealed concerning this subject. And as it is being revealed, also the righteousness of Jesus Christ is being revealed because the mark of the beast is the third angel's message. And so as the light about it continues to shine more, so the light on the third angel's message in verity, which is justification by faith, also continues to shine. This is the glory of God that has to cover the whole world. And so with that introduction, I want us to look at uh, some few things and uh, what is the biblical definition of sin? And uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that uh, Sister Adeline is just coming in in time because uh, I, I believe that this will also help uh, out some issues or questions she have raised previously. Uh, the questions are we born sinners and all that. Uh, in the first two presentations, I have tried to deal with the history of what the pioneers believed and what Sister White believed and uh, uh, the dangers of believing in original sin or born sinners. But uh, we, we want to narrow down some few things here. Uh, what is the biblical definition of sin? Definition of sin, 1 John 3, 4. Whoever committed sin transgresses also the law for sin is transgression of the law. It seems that the Bible is so clear on what is sin. Sin is transgression of the law. Whoever committed sin, actually he is transgressing the law. So sin is the transgression of the law. There has been so much controversy about this 
until we have come to the doctrine that uh, sin is nature. And we saw how this is dangerous in during the midday because of the charges that Satan have had uh, about uh, the nature of Jesus Christ. On through the matter so that people may not have a right uh, uh, knowledge of uh, the humanity of Jesus Christ and what it really entails in justification. So identifying sin, uh, particular sins was defining what sin is. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 4 says, um, high look and a proud heart, the plowing of the wicked is sin. Proverbs 24, 9, the thought of foolishness is sin. It's a particular uh, identification of sin. Romans 14, 23, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And this is the heart of the message that uh, uh, justification by faith is uh, the third angel's message in verity. And uh, it has to do with faith. The faith in Christ to be able to save us humbly is the faith of Jesus Christ. James chapter 4, verse 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. As you can be able to see on the screen, all unrighteousness is sin. But the center of all this actually is selfishness because it is selfishness which actually leads us to have a proud heart. It is selfishness that makes us have thoughts of foolishness. It is a uh, lack of faith. This is uh, exalting of self saying that I can do this and I can do that. This is actually not of faith. This is what brings about uh, uh, sin. And uh, knowing what to do and not doing it, just remaining in, uh, uh, in your dormant state, thinking that you're not doing bad or good and then it's okay to you. This is selfishness also, it is sin. All unrighteousness is in defining what sin is first John 3 for whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. We want to take the Bible as it reads. We don't want to take the Bible and put other meanings on the word of God. When you read the great controversy, we are told that uh, spiritualism is not taking the word of God the way it is. This is what is spiritualism. And many people are really in spiritualism. And we will want to root out this habit of uh, spiritualism where uh, in GC we are told that uh, spiritualism, uh, let me just see if I, I can put it on the screen. What is spiritualism? Sorry, I, I can't find that quote, but uh, when I find it, uh, I'll give it because spiritualism is not taking the scripture the way they read. And uh, you put another meaning into what uh, uh, is being spoken. And so, uh, as I was saying that uh, many of us are actually in uh, spiritualism. They don't take the word of God the way it reads. And this has led even to redefinition of uh, what sin is. And this have led many people uh, to wander away from the truth that the Bible will want us to uh, get. So 1 John 3, 4, so ever committed sin transgresses also the law for sin is the transgression of the law. The law of God, what are the characteristics of the law? This is, let us look at it. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is some of the characteristics of the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. Romans 7.7, 7, I had not known sin, but by the law. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamb and the law is a light and a reproof of instruction at the way of life. 
Psalms 119.96, I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. So when we are talking about that uh, sin is the transgression of the law, we are talking about the exceeding, uh, uh, exceeding revelation of the law of God. The commandments of God being broader than what we think. Uh, try to think of uh, um, Jesus Christ, someone of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And how he expounded on the law more than what the Pharisees thought it was. So with our human eyes and uh, our imperfect reasoning, we take the mere letter of the law and say that uh, now you see, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, and I'm doing this and I'm doing this, now I'm perfect. But the law of God is exceedingly broad because it does not just contain the letter of the law, but contains the spirit of the law. When we talk about breaking the law, it goes beyond the letter, but the spirit of it, what are the motives of what you are doing? Why do you what you do? Why do you refrain uh, from what you do not do? Continued on. The law of Jehovah is exceedingly broad. Jesus plainly declared to his disciples that this holy law of God may be violated in even the thoughts and feelings and desires as well as in the word and the mind, character, and personality, volume one, page 32. First Chronicles 28, nine, for the Lord searcheth all the hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. And this, this is why uh, when we talk about character formation and justification by faith, we talk about Christ being able to overcome uh, sin and not sinning by thought or by action. We must go beyond uh, uh, the not speaking of anything which is evil and not participating in it by uh, coming to the perfection of uh, what is in our minds. We must come to a point that uh, we are sealed on our foreheads and then that uh, our mind is inclined to the things of heaven. The law of God is a mirror to show man the defects in his character, the river and the herald, March uh, 8, 1870. Romans 7, 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. God and his holy law. The law is the transcript of God's character. It presents his righteousness in contrast with unrighteousness. Levi and Herald, July 25, 1899. And so when we look at the law, we see the perfect image of God himself because it's a revelation of his character. Uh, what is a transcript? It's a written or a printed version of material originally presented in another media. So when we, when, we, when we read about the law, when we think about the law, when we meditate upon it, we are penetrating into the very being of the God we serve and uh, actually worship. Leviticus 11, for I am the Lord your God, you shall thereof, therefore sanctify yourself and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are judgment a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So to transgress against the law is to go against the character of God himself. Psalms 32, verse 1. It is the transgression of the law. The Great Controversy, chapter 29, Origin of Evil, page 493. Bear with me for a minute. And so if, uh, 
we will change what actually is the definition of sin, then so many things will be affected. So many things will be affected. There are many ideas in the world as to what is sin. This is Bible Echo, November 5, 1894, paragraph five. There are many ideas in the world as to what is sin, but what does the word of God define it to be? John writes, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Without the law, we have no knowledge of what is sin. God's law not only covers every deed of outward life, but also penetrates the intents and purposes of the heart. Uh, I hope that as we give the definition of sin, you are also seeing how uh, broad is the law of God and how judgment what judgment entails, because in this judgment, which is done by the law of God, it goes to the intents, penetrates to the intents and the purposes of the heart. And so when we are talking about the definition of sin, we should also think about judgment. And as we think about judgment, we also have to think about what justification actually brings in our, in our lives. Because if justification is to reclaim us from sin, then it means it is not just the written law that we are talking about here, but this law, the totality of it entails the thoughts, the intents, the motives of the heart. This is what actually the law covers. And so let us not fancy ourselves because we can look at the written law and see that we are not doing anything that is contrary to God, then we are safe. Let us think even about our motives in judgment and what justification does. It reclaims us even from the evil thoughts. That is why Christ says in the book of Hebrews chapter eight from verses 10 onward, that this is the commandment, this is the covenant that I will make with thee. I'll write the law on the tables of your heart and not on the stone. And this is what we call the spirit of the law because the letter of the law is something which is outside and can be read. But the spirit of the law is written in our hearts. When God says that I'll give you a new heart and I'll sprinkle water on the heart of stones and give you a fleshy heart, then write my law there. He is writing on our hearts the spirit of the law so that as we think in our hearts and as we uh, uh, act it will be in unison the intents and the motives of what is written in our hearts will correspond with what is written in the outside and so we continue with uh, uh, looking at this exceeding broadness of the law Those who have allowed their mind to become beclouded in regard to what constitutes sins are fearfully deceived. Unless they make a decided change, they will be found winding when God pronounces judgment upon the children of men. They have transgressed the law and broken the everlasting covenant, and they will receive according to their work. Testimonies, volume 9, page 267. So it's a fearful thing to be beclouded in what regards or constitutes sin. You need not talk about getting along without any law and yet know what sin is. The only definition of sin given in the Bible is sin is the transgression of the law. Manuscript release volume nine, page 249, paragraph one. So don't be deceived in getting along without the law. If you say that you can dispense with the law, then how will you know what is sin? You cannot say that you can dispense with the law and yet say you have the definition of sin. You see what inspiration say? You need not to talk about getting along without any law and yet know what is sin. So there is no knowledge of sin without 
the law. A terrible doom awaits the sinner, and therefore it is necessary that we know what sin is in order that we may escape from it is power. John says, whatsoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. Here we have the true definition of sin. It is the transgression of the law. How often the sinner is urged to leave his sins and come to Jesus, but he is not told that sin is transgression of the law. That is why we have Sunday churches. That is why we have other denominations saying that we are headed to heaven. Yet, what are they doing? They are transgressing this law of God. And so if you will come up with another definition of sin, you will have to come up with another definition of what is the mark of the beast. You will have to come up with another uh, 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 entailed story of the end time events. You will You'll have nothing to speak about uh, the mark of the beast and the seal of God, because this is what is entailing the face to face with the real gospel by Dennis Preby, pages 37 and 38. If sin is our nature, then we have no control over that. And we are sinners by nature. If sin is our character, then we do have control over the choices we make. And we are sinners by choice. And how do we become sinners by choice? By knowing what the law says we should do or we should do and yet we remain ignorant of uh, executing what our Lord wants us to execute. We are told, on the same basis, if sinlessness means a sinless nature, then that is possible only at the second coming of Christ because we retain our sinful natures until that time. However, if sinlessness means a sinless character, then that is the possible whenever we choose not to sin. So a wrong definition of sin will lead you into not having the sanctuary message, the close of probation on all those things. What we'll have to do is just to live and wait for the second coming of Jesus Christ. But if we know what is the definition of sin, then we will work uh, our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is the will, it is God who wills to do his own good pleasure in us by having the perfect character, a transcript of his character, which is revealed in his law. Our definition of sin is the determining factor. If we mean nature, when we use the word sin, then there can be no sinlessness until the second coming of Christ. If we mean character, when we use the term sin, then sinlessness is possibility before the second coming of Jesus Christ. These are the uh, uh, nitty gritties. These are the cracks of the matter that involves the definition of sin and righteousness by faith. Can man have victor over sin before probation closes? Can he be able to overcome before the high priest leaves the most holy place? And can he maintain the same character when he doesn't have an advocate, but he has a defender when the plagues are falling? Living as an example, what did Satan know about the flesh that Jesus received? And this we have looked in details during the lunchtime. Clad in the vestments of humanity, the Son of God came down to the level of those who wish to save. In him was no guile or sinfulness. He was ever pure and undefiled. Yet he took upon his, him our sinful nature, clothing his divinity with humanity that the, he might associate with fallen humanity. He sought to regain for man that which, by disobedience, Adam had lost for himself and for the world. Review and Herald, December 15, 1896, paragraph 7. Key to Victor, the son of God, who is the image of the father's past became man's advocate and redeemed. He humbled himself in taking the nature of man in his fallen condition, but he did not take the chain of sin. Manuscript releases volume 20, page 124. So by taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He did not transgress the law of God. He was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses of the flesh, which humanities encompassed, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Himself took our infirmities and bear our weaknesses. He was touched. Uh, he was touched with the feelings of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are and yet he was without spot. So how was he tempted? To get clear understanding of the nature which Christ received at birth, we must understand 
how he was tempted. The man of his temptation reveals the type of nature in which he faced in them. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted as we are. It is believed by some persons that Jesus had only innocent infirmities such as hunger, thirst, and tiredness, and therefore tempted in accordance with these infirmities. And he may only, he was only tempted in the wilderness. But for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. If Jesus was tempted as we are, what is temptation and how are we tempted? This all encompasses our definition of sin. This all entails how we are made righteous and how we are accepted before God. If the feeling or emotion to act in accordance with an instinct or desire which is contrary to the will of God, this is temptation, the risk of possibility of sinning. Was Jesus tempted to be selfish? Yes, he was tempted. And what is selfishness? Not loving your neighbor as you love yourself. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so the temptation is not sin here. The action itself is sin. You can be tempted with this and with that, but that does not equate to sinning. Sinning is the, uh, is the voluntary participation in an act that is against God, having thoughts that are against God, yielding to those thoughts, I mean. James 1, 3, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So the work of temptation comes from Satan, it doesn't come from uh, are from God. God may pass us through trials or may allow circumstances to happen in our lives so that our character may come forth when we are purified. Then when Jesus, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil? Why was it necessary for Jesus to be tempted as we are? We are told, Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons of daughters and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. This is why he took Jesus Christ into the wilderness of temptation so that he may transgress the law of God and be found a sin. And thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. You see, love is the principle of the commandments of God. And if Christ could have participated or yielded to any uh, selfish thoughts and did what he wanted for his own survival, then he could have sinned against God. If they could not keep the law, then where was, then there was fault with the lawgiver. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations against God in asserting that men cannot keep the law of God. Jesus humbled himself, clothing his divinity with humanity in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family. And by both precept and example, condemn sin in the flesh. And uh, give the light and, and give the light to certain charges. He was subjected to the fierce temptation that human nature can know, yet he sinned not, for sin is the transgression of the law. So in all these things that the devil was doing to our Savior and our Lord, what he was targeting is that Christ may exhibit a thought or an action which is against the law of God, which is be built on the principle of love. But we are told that he was tempted in every way, but without sin. So we are bound to thank the Lord because uh, what he really wants us to get the right ideas of uh, what is sin and what it entails. And so Christ came. He knew that Adam in Eden with his superior advantages might have withstood the temptation of Satan and conquered him. And so he did not come in his nature, but he came in the nature of a fallen man a perfect environment where all his needs were readily and sufficiently supplied. These are the advantages that Adam had. 
perfect faculties and mental physical made directly from the hand of God. Adam had a natural instinct and ability to obey the will of God with no internal inclination to disobedience. No need to learn righteousness. No need for an external source of mental or spiritual strength to live righteously. But now we see what he, Jesus, also knew that it was not possible for man out of Eden, separated from the light and love of God in the fall, to resist the temptation of Satan in his own strength. And then what did he do? Hence, the Lord Jesus came to our world, not to reveal what God could do, but what a man could do. Through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Man is through faith to be a partake of the divine nature and to overcome every temptation, whether with his beset. The Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam through faith in Jesus Christ serve him in the human nature which we now have. He served his father in the nature that uh, he had. He was able to overcome every fierce temptation. So Christ took our place and he demonstrated that we can overcome sin to prove to the universe that the law of God can be kept. And so for those who overcome, they have to follow his example. They have to bring their bodily appetites and passion under the control of the higher conscience. They must subject their lower passion. And so Christ has died for us, leaving us an example. He was beset, he was tempted every way. He was enticed in every way but he was able to overcome. And so, as we learn about the definition of sin, we learn about subjecting ourselves. We learn about giving our will and having uh, 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 our will to God and having the mind of Christ. Christ had, our hum had a human body and a mind uh, as we have, yet, Daily, he uh, submitted to the will of the Father. When you read Luke chapter 22, verse 42, let us look at it. Luke 22, verses 42. We are told, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So how do we know the will of God? We know the will of God from his written word. We know the intent and thoughts of God from his word. And this is what Christ came to do on earth, the will of God. He says in the book of Matthew that I did not come to break the law, but to fulfill it until heaven passes away. No jot, no tittle will be taken from the law. The human will of Christ will have not led him to wilderness of temptation, to fast and to be tempted of the devil. It will not have led him to endure humiliation, scorn, reproach, suffering and death. His human nature shrank from all these things as decidedly as our shrinks from them. And so our shrinking from these things do not actually mean that uh, we are sinners. This is human weakness. Our going into charging God uh, with complaints about our nature and then yielding to the temptation of the devil is what actually is sin. What did Christ live to do? It was the will of his heavenly father. Though tempted and pushed by the enemy of sort, his will still was to do the, the, the will of the father. Was though beset by weaknesses and could feel that this I cannot go on. Uh, I cannot go to Calvary. Yet by faith he held the hand of the omnipotent. Behold, a virgin shall be the child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted is God with us. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and asleep by his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. Christ had not changed his divinity for humanity, but he had clothed his divinity in humanity. The divinity of Christ is assuring of eternal life. And so uh, what we have to do, get the right definition of sin 
and then we can comprehend how we can even overcome sin itself. If we get it wrong, then we cannot overcome sin. This will help us in this definition of sin, in this understanding of the human nature of Jesus Christ to know whom we can rely on for victory over sin. Did he ever use his divine power? No. Always Jesus Christ used divine power for the benefiting of humanity. He wrote all things for the goodness of humanity. He knew how sin is something that displaces God and he never lived to uh, his own will, but the will of his father. It was not part of his mission to exercise divine power for his own benefit. This never did in his earthly life. His miracles were all for the good of others. When you read the uh, uh, Spirit of Prophecy, volume two, page uh, 92. So as uh, we continue learning about uh, what is sin and uh, what it means to overcome sin, we will draw closer to Christ. As Satan continues with his charges against Christ, God will have a people who will be able to hold on unto the truth which is written in his word and then be able to understand that the charges of the enemy are to nothing. The reason why the devil is trying to bring a lot of confusion in this world so it, is that we may be we may lose uh, the power to overcome. We may lose our faith in God. And then he will have gained his main goal. He will have achieved the goal that he wants. The charges that he has against God that uh, his law will not be obeyed, he will achieve it. By first of, of all, having us have a wrong conception of sin, having a wrong conception of the nature of Jesus Christ. He will go to seduce us into lying doctrines. So entering into the last segment, we are told in Review and Herald, it was uh, as difficult for him to keep the level of humanity as it is for men to rise above the lower level of their depraved natures and be partakers of the divine nature. He heard only to rely on his father. And also we have to rely on him who has the victory. He says in Matthew chapter 28, all power is given unto me. And when he says all powers, then it means to put the glory of man in dust and then do for humanity what they cannot do. This is the message of justification by faith in dust. And then he may do what man could not do. In the message of justification by faith, uh, we are told about that uh, he needed to be uh, 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 directed again, back again to his divine nature because and Jesus interposed so that we may be able to overcome us. And so what do we learn by all this? What is the sum of all and victory tells us that humanity must copy the pattern. Man must become a partake of the device, live with different nature than he had. How can we copy the pattern if we have different definitions of what is seen? If we have a different opinion of what is sin, if we have a different opinion, what is the nature of Jesus Christ? How can we be able to seek the victory that we are told to seek? I pray that uh, 
still we may continue learning that uh, the Lord may continue embracing truth on our hearts. And at the end of the day, as uh, we continue in this truth, we may also uh, teach others to walk in the same truth. For we cannot tell the people to walk in the truth that uh, we ourselves uh, do not know. If we have confused ideas, we will just cause confusion uh, in other people's uh, life. We will not have anything to tell the people if we have the erroneous view of uh, what we teach. And so I'd like to end by saying that uh, uh, we are to be sealed by the seal of God. And what is the seal of God? The seal of God is uh, uh, having the truth of God, both spiritual and intellectual. This is the seal of God, having the truth both spiritually and intellectually. So God be with us and uh, may we continue always to sit as he, uh, at his feet as he teaches us about uh, the truth as is revealed in his word. Let us close with that, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I say thank you for your word which is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. Your word is light, your word is a lamp. And we want to get the fullness of it that we may walk in all truth and righteousness. And so I pray that you may continue blessing us, open our eyes and give us a discerning spirit to know the times that you are living in and what you are calling us to. You say that as we see darkness, growing thicker in this and then in this world we should arise and let our light shine and so help us to understand what it means to have victor over sin it is only by comprehending your majesty and greatness that lord we can be able to increase our faith we can pray increase our faith and be able to walk in all truth that we know thank you for this Hour and thank you for being with us in Jesus' name, amen.